whenever you're ready, Dale. Thank you. Yeah. All right, my name is Dale Brown, founder of the Threat Management Center, located in Detroit. I started in 1995 uh, in the security capacity, helping the community deal with violent criminals. We're doing home invasions and murders in our area. Uh, I lived on East Jefferson, and what made me get started was I saw that there was a lot of families that were, um, you know, needing assistance. There was no one helping them. I would call police. I would constantly reach out. And when law enforcement arrived, they often had an adversarial position. They were not nice to the people that had helped them in general dealing with violence. But they also wouldn't help them uh, understand how to uh, protect themselves or how to use the legal system. And uh, what I found was there was a general apathy and complacency where law enforcement was just not interested as a group. There were certain officers who were motivated, and those community-oriented officers uh, bonded with our organization, and we were able to, with their assistance, uh, create a condition where all the murders, home invasions, and other types of violent crimes stopped. The results of stopping the violence and the criminal activity was a good quality of life for the residents that lived there, which ultimately led to the building owners going to the black for the first time in 20 years. So imagine these people have been living there, they're getting home invaded constantly, it was one murder every month, and all of a sudden, with the beginning of this program, uh, we were able to stop everything. And it just took a couple of good officers, and my staff consisted of it uh, initially, because uh, this is just of me, a dog, and a rifle. And then it just grew from there. I just got volunteers from the community to help out. I got the building owners to give me one free apartment in each building, and a small financial stipend. It didn't take much money, but it took a lot of self-sacrifice. The key was to put the protection of the families before my own and to think about one thing, which was good quality of life for the people there. The byproduct, which was the money, which we now have boats and Hummers and other vehicles, uh, tactical vehicles that we can go out and help more people with, and including this 10,000 square foot facility I have now, all came from one thing, creating positive nonviolent outcomes. And the way to do that was to use not the legal system to prosecute people, but to prevent the conditions which led to, which could lead to, violent encounters. We create conditions where violence and violent criminals do not feel safe, they do not operate there, they want to leave the area, and we do it in a non-aggressive, uh, non-violent way by using psychology as the platform for how we motivate them to believe the area is not conducive for violence and crime. Uh, and so that being said, the, fa the families that live there, the kids that get to see a positive environment without any arrests, without anything that appear appears to be uh, inappropriate for them, and that was the point, to make sure that the kids here in Detroit, uh, were like the kids I grew up with in Ann Arbor, they happen to have a good quality of life, uh, they can focus on their studies, they can focus on the things that they need to and not worry about their safety every day. Uh, and so our point is this should be the same for every city, that the community and law enforcement has to work together. If we can get the good officers, those officers are truly community oriented. They're not motivated by position and power. Those officers that are genuinely interested in public safety to bond with fam families and community members that are leaders in their communities, that they want that good quality of life for their families and their communities, and get them to work together to prevent the conditions, not to create conditions for prosecution. Those two things are opposite. If we focus on prosecution, we have crime. If we focus on prevention, we don't have crime or prosecutions. The quality of life of the officer would therefore improve, the taxes go up because there's more businesses in the area, and families live a better quality of life right where they are, whatever city or whatever town they're in, right here in America, which makes a better life for everyone. Uh, and again, the focal point is through public safety, a nonviolent method of public safety, we're able to create a condition which creates, to, creates a great community. And that includes having heroic law enforcement officers out there putting themselves at risk, not thinking about themselves, not thinking about getting home to their families safely at night, but thinking about the citizens getting home to their families, first and foremost, we need that kind of policing. The kind of policing we have right now typically is an officer thinking about their own safety, and that's what they're taught. That false thought process means they can't truly protect anyone appropriately because they're not willing to put themselves at risk uh, by their intentions that which are stated. If you psychologically are not prepared to put yourself at risk for others, if you're not psychologically prepared to love everyone that you need to protect, then you cannot do what it takes to create that safety that they need to prevent violence from occurring. The cornerstone for protection is love, not violence, not guns, not laws. It, you cannot and you will not truly protect anything that you do not love. But if you love something, love someone, love people, you can protect them and it starts with yourself. Having people that love themselves, 
love their uh, family members, love their community, love people in general. Those are the people that can protect the best because they will put themselves at risk for others and that is the key, that level of intention and dedication is the key to stopping violent predatory behavior. When a violent criminal sees a police officer or a citizen is willing to die and kill for another one or for themselves, when they believe that, when the truly violent predator believes that the superior intention is to the protector, then they will simply not attack. And that's what you want. You want violent predators who do exist in all communities, whether it's Columbine or uh, Virginia Tech University or any of these places. You want uh, these Sandy Hook Elementary School, you want these predators to realize there is no way they're going to achieve violence perpetrated against families because, or the people that are there, because when the violent predator sees them, they're going to realize this person is dedicated to the safety there and they're going to back down. And if they don't back down, that person will be able to manage threats properly if they go through our training. And that's the purpose of our school, to train people on how to use psychology, law, and skills to defend themselves, their communities, and their corporations, primarily using psychology, law, and skills to prevent violence from occurring. But if it did occur, making sure that you have superior capability so you can dominate threats. And that's what really separates our organization from any other is the fact that it really is designated and designed specifically to create nonviolence, but if there is going to be violence, to make sure that you're significantly capable of managing those threats properly in the best way possible, utilizing the best techniques, the best strategies to create the least amount of violent encounter. Do you want to talk about some of the components that you all do here in the threat management center now, like in terms of training and different demographics and stuff like that? Yep, some of the things we do here, we offer free training to families. We call it Free Family Friday. Typically, the prosecutor's offices, the shelters in the area for domestic violence victims, stalking victims are sent to us for assistance. We protect them for free. We ask to go to the court. If they have a violent um, ex-husband or boyfriend or neighbor or some stranger that's, that's coming after them, we will literally stay with them, transport their kids to school. We stay with them at their homes with our rifles and keep them alive. And in 20 years, none of us have uh, had a court date. And more importantly, none of us have been killed. And the most important, no one who's ever come to us for help in 20 years has ever been injured or killed after coming to this organization. And what's interesting is one of the things that people um, often find very unique is the fact that our organization is based on altruism. Our bodyguard program, which is called VIPER, stands for Violence Intervention Protective Emergency Response System. And our bodyguard training system, uh, the, the foundation for its success is in the fact that the individuals that are in our organization, in order to participate, have to be altruistic. They have to agree to not be mission, to be mission motivated, to not be money motivated. Uh, the reason for that is because if you try to protect someone and you're money motivated, what's going to happen is your cowardice is going to come out at your time of greatest need. So when a family depends on you, when an individual depends on you, and the only reason that you're protecting them is for money, when you realize that there's a dedicated gunman coming to kill that person, what you're going to do is you're going to run if you're money motivated, because you're going to realize at the last minute that as a person who's only protecting for money, you can't spend money if you were to die. So you will have to run now. But if you were mission motivated, you realize the mission was to keep this person alive. And the only way that they're going to be killed is if they kill you first. And then what we do is make sure we have a training system to support that, that endeavor to create that positive outcome so you're not just giving your life away. So understanding psychology, human reaction time, uh, biomechanics as it relates to weapons in the hand, understanding how to create a nonviolent outcome by understanding how to use psychology to project using your body language uh, so that they don't feel that there's an opportunity to attack, understanding how to read their body language so you can see the predatory condition, the precursors to violent behavior before the predator has a chance to strike. And then being physically in position, what we call protective proxemics, so that you can dominate that threat should they try to still pull a gun or a knife. And when we say dominate, we also mean the ability to escape, control, or immobilize based on your determination of what you think the best uh, technique or strategy is to use in this particular circumstance you find yourself in. What we emphasize is 100 ways in a situation which would normally be fatal force oriented a hundred ways to not have a violent or fatal incident take place. So even though they pull a gun or a knife, we show you how to disarm that knife. We show police officers the same thing on Mondays. We have a free class for any sworn law enforcement officer with a state trooper that I've trained for 10 years who's in charge of the law enforcement section here. The law enforcement training program here is called Enforcer Tech. The program that we teach for free is called NICE program. NICE stands for Non-Injury Compliance Enforcement. 
And that's showing police officers specifically, not just hold up how to maintain control of their gun or if someone wanted you to grab it without killing that person. We also show them how to subjugate people without injuring them and without getting injured themselves. So we show police officers very simple methods to dominating a person who even means negative or violent intent towards that police officer, but showing the police officer very simple ways to dominate physically that person without leaving a single mark, without injuring that person, and definitely without killing that person who may have even had the intention to kill that officer. So giving that officer that ability that toggle, that ability to switch from uh, the escape mode to control mode to um, a higher level of force mode gives the officer the ability to make their own determinations. But when they have an option to not injure someone, often they would choose that had their training system given that to them. And we don't believe in being weapon dependent here. Here, guns are uh, like a first aid kit, something you should have, but not something you should depend on. Just like you wouldn't jump off a building because you're a first aid kit, you shouldn't go into violent conflict with humans because you have a pistol. Pistols shoot at less than 3,000 feet per second, which means they leave what's called a short-term wound cavity. That short-term wound cavity translates into, in force on force conflict in close quarters, time in which a person could strike you back, stab you back, or shoot you back if you shot them with your pistol in the first place. So that's one more reason why we do not teach uh, the use of a firearm is the way to manage close quarters threat. So we show you how to get close, how to use psychology to, uh, to take that person's perspective and change it so there is no adversarial perspective. And if there is going to be one, you're so close, you can still take control of that person without injuring them. And that's what police officers really like about our training program. And this is what we like about teaching police officers. We need to hear the feedback from police officers that say they use this training in real life and it helped them dominate and they feel good about what they did. They feel confident, but it's based on competence, not based on gun confidence. And that lack of gun confidence means that they're not gun dependent, which means they don't believe the gun is the answer for all their problems. And so that's one of the things we do is try to fill a person's toolbox, thinking of their mental toolbox as uh, the toolbox that you go around answering all your questions with. We make sure that in that toolbox are so many options to create a nonviolent outcome that it's almost impossible to have violence. So again, what Threat Management Center represents in general is how to properly manage human threats to create the most nonviolent outcome possible. Uh, could you just touch on, like, uh, you have some paid clients and stuff like that that uh, like the way y'all operate? Maybe just touch on that real briefly or some of the tools y'all have. Um, as an organization, uh, we're very strict in terms of how we behave. We teach. One of the things that I extol in general uh, for our team members is um, that anytime there's any type of uh, inappropriate outcomes, it's their fault. They are directly accountable. They must create peace. It's not an option. If they're really talented, they'll be able to subjugate someone, take them into custody, and arrest them for police and hold them for police without ever touching them. And that's what we consider the highest level of skill. If you have to put your hands on them, we consider that a form of failure. And if weapons are ever involved, we consider that a high level of failure. So it's that kind of philosophy that gets us that nonviolent outcome as well. It's giving the individual practitioner a belief system to support the endeavors we're looking for. Um, Corporations like it because what that means is we don't have collateral issues. When we, when we manage their violence issues, what happens is we end up with no problems. No problems means there's no lawsuits. That means there's no brand image damage by uh, altercations between security, uh, law enforcement, and others on their property or in their corporate domain. We make sure that there's no direct correlation between that corporate name and a violent negative outcome or an embarrassing situation. So the proper management of threat uh, by definition means negative things do not happen positive things happen, and when that happens, productivity increases, and as a result, the byproduct is prosperity. And that prosperity translates into prosperity for the organization that brings it, i.e. us. We create positive outcomes for corporations and communities, and as a result, we make money. And that's the only way we make money, is through creating these positive outcomes. So other organizations get money from the government, or they get it from um, trading time for money. All we have are our positive results, and as a result, we constantly have opportunities because when you create excellent outcomes, there's always an avenue and, a, and there's always clients that want those excellent outcomes. Excellent. Do you have any, uh, uh, any word, anybody maybe watching from the area that might want to like get involved with y'all? Are you guys, I don't know how, how often you guys take new people or? Constantly. Uh, one of the things that we do is we constantly recruit. We're a performance-based organization. Performance is everything. We call it performance. Professional performance, those two words together for 
uh, form the word performance. So performance is everything. No, nothing for participation matters. So here, our lifeblood of this organization is having people that are really talented, really motivated, and highly skilled by constantly training them. And those people that do not want to train or are not good enough are replaced by better people. So we constantly are recruiting, constantly looking for good people, highly motivated people that are, when I say motivated, motivated about helping people have a better quality of life. That's it. We are not looking for people, we do not accept people who are uh, human predator uh, oriented. So people that like to fight or people that like to shoot people. Uh, a lot of times guys come back from the military uh, organizations and I have to um, be careful because we're not looking for the kind of mindset that says, you know what, it's okay to use violence uh, as long as you can legally explain it. We're looking for people that don't want to use violence under any conditions, even if it is legal. And that's a certain kind of uh, character. So that kind of person we're looking for specifically when they start, and then we constantly train. We train like a football team. On a given week, we have to train at least 10 hours minimum of tactical training. Uh, so like a football team, we train two hours a day, five days a week, and then they have a game on the weekend. We have games every day, meaning we do we perform 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We protect communities here in Detroit, uh, upscale communities like Palmer Woods, Shore Forest, and the golf course, which are very affluent neighborhoods where the average home is between seven and 10,000 square feet. We have approximately 1,000 homes that depend on us for safety, responding to them and their uh, families and their emergencies. And we have approximately 500 home, uh, businesses that are our clients as well. Um, and then the people that cannot afford our services, we help them for free. And the reason why we can do that and the reason that we can do that is because there is a healthy profit margin left over from excellence uh, from providing for our major corporations. So it's all, it's all positive. Creating positive outcomes, nonviolence, equals a prosperous outcome. And that's one of the things we want to encourage all communities, all corporations, law enforcement institutions to realize it is focusing on the prevention of the conditions which leads to violence, which is the key to creating a safe, successful society. A safe city is a city that is going to be very prosperous. So all of our efforts need, need to be placed in not prosecution, but into prevention. Wow. Online. Good stuff. Yeah. So tell me about Cop Block. It's a uh, decentralized Where project. It's been around a few years now. And, uh, okay, did you call? Did you call yeah, that one? Uh, essentially, our goal is police accountability and just trying to educate people. Okay. Um, the the one way. Interaction. Right. Where where are you? Okay. All right. There, I'm sorry, I wouldn't worse, you guys. All right, guys. Okay. I'll catch you later. Yeah, can you look at this thing over here so that my client can't have the phone? Okay.